very controversial police accountability bill scheduled to be voted on in Connecticut here today. A lot of people in law enforcement, while they say they are in support of change, that does not mean they're in full support of this bill. Now, keep in mind, there's 41 different parts to this, so there's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about the broad brushstrokes here, and for that, I'm happy to have Sergeant John Krupinski from the Connecticut State Fraternal Order of Police joining me on the phone. Uh, Sergeant, thank you so much for the time. I know just right before we went on the air, you said you are all for change and trying to make how policing is done better, but you said this bill addresses none of the real issues. Please elaborate on that. Well, sir, well, one of the things we need to address, uh, you don't even see the words community policing in the bill. We need to address a better relationship between our, our, our police officers and our communities, and this is something the bill totally left out. There is not, I'm not against change, but I'm, against, I'm for real change. Um, this bill does nothing. There's not one second of training in this bill. If we're expecting and want police officers to act differently, the only way you accomplish that is by training them differently. Nowhere in this bill do they have any training. Um, the bill is more of a feel-good bill than anything else, so legislators can say, hey, we voted for it. But there isn't anything in this that's real change. I believe maybe there, there's one codicil for implicit bias training, but uh, your point stands uh, now. Well, uh, it, uh, of the it, 41 things in the bill, what would be the single biggest deal breaker? It looks like the Connecticut uh, Police Chiefs Union thinks that the lack of qualified immunity, meaning you can't go after police officers for personal liability for anything they do on the job. This bill would get rid of that. That seems to be their biggest sticking point. Is that yours? Uh, yeah, that is that. That's what changes policing as you know it today. Um, let me explain qualified immunity. People don't understand it. I continually hit lawmakers telling me it protects bad cops. Actually, the only cops that qualified immunity does not protect are bad cops. Qualified immunity only protects you in the performance of your job if you've done everything within your rules, protocols, and a bad cop who's outside of that. It does not protect. So the guy who uses excessive force, punches someone unjustly, he's not covered by qualified immunity. Who is covered by qualified immunity? The average good cop who's out there doing his job and, and gets sued. I, I equate qualified immunity to, look, you're probably all good drivers, but nobody would drive their car without insurance. Well, police officers aren't going to go out and work without insurance if, that is, if at this point, that's going to then cost them their, their, their lives, their families, uh, their houses. It's not going to happen. So what's going to happen if this law passes the way it is with qualified immunity? We're going to get the New York City effect where everybody looks the other way because you don't want to be involved in anything because if it's sued, it's no longer the city who sets the rules and has you do these things, be responsible for it. Now every lawsuit is going to be paid out of your pocket. Well, Sergeant, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just to try to put a finer point, I believe the big worry here is that there would be tons and tons of completely frivolous lawsuits that you believe would be filed against police officers, which would still take money to fight, regardless of how uh, frivolous or non-frivolous they may be. Is that correct? That is 100 percent correct. Now, the, the city is responsible to deal with those. Um, they supply the lawyers and whatnot. If if qualified immunity is gone, every week I'd have to go down and give a lawyer a retainer. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say, hey, I don't want to get involved in this. Whoa. And that's what that that's what what you have in New York City right now is is a city whose mayor, whose whose governor doesn't back them up, and we're seeing the results of that. This would just be the results of that here. Okay, so if, if there is some sort of compromise to be made because police, uh, the general public still thinks there might be some room for movement on that one particular issue, what would a compromise look like in your eyes, if any? Uh, I'm going to tell you there isn't a compromise on that. Um, it currently doesn't protect bad cops and does protect good cops. So what kind of a compromise could we possibly have? Well, I know there's always uh, out there the, the statistic that since 2001, I think of a total of 76 uh, deadly police uh, incidents that were investigated. Only one of them 
resulted in officers facing charges, and I think some people are suspicious of that. Of course, there's more finer details to get into there, but uh, how do you address at least the public perception? Because you are in a job like the media is, where if the public thinks you have a problem, you have a problem one way or another because there's just public opinion. Well, sadly, Connecticut has been far ahead of the curve of these other states for many, many years. Um, we have been progressively making laws, making changes, where uh, some of the other states have not. Um, you know, we're, we're out here trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist at this point in time. Um, I'm, I'm not saying we can't do things better. Absolutely, we can always have room for improvement. The governor came out with an executive order with 10 bullet points. I don't know if he didn't realize it or not, but Connecticut already did eight of them. So we are doing the right thing here now, and it has been done in the past. Uh, one last thing before we let you go. I know another thing uh, in an email that you had sent to us that you were worried about was one of the provisions that would prohibit police departments from getting their hands on military equipment. And that's something you so see a lot of uh, uh, people talking about when they're criticizing police, that it's becoming overly militarized. But you think this is going too far by depriving you of very necessary equipment. Well, you got to understand, it doesn't deprive us of the equipment. We, uh, the, the, the issue, like, uh, I'm a Danbury police officer, we have 75 patrol rifles that were given to us by the government directly after the Newtown sh school shooting. We use these patrol rifles for active shooters. I haven't heard any of these citizens out there say they don't want us to respond to an active shooter to take care of business. Well, when you go to an active shooter, you need a patrol rifle. Now, it doesn't say we can't have them. It says we can't have the free ones from the government. So meaning if this bill is signed the way it is, we have to get back the 75 rifles. If we get back the 75 rifles, now my city will have to go out and purchase them. Does that make any sense whatsoever for a lawmaker to do, put a burden on cities to spend money that could be spent on other programs? I would rather take that 115000 and use it for community programs to, to proactively go out there and have good, good times between the police and the community. But instead, I mean, it, it, it's another stupid rule that they just a feel-good rule they put in there. It also makes us return watercraft. All of the departments down on the Gold Coast that have gotten boats, boats are used for rescuing people, drowning people, boat accidents, sinking boats. I, I don't know of any way a boat can be used offensively. We'd, boat, well, watercraft is named in the bill, if you look. We'd have to give those back. Uh, a dive boat costs about three hundred and fifty to 650000 It makes no sense to me. They're not saying we can't have them. They're saying we can't have the free stuff. Well, Sergeant, thank you so much for uh, clarifying that position right there and for taking the time to talk with us. I'll, I'll be honest, I'd love to have you back on. We're on until 11, and there's so much little things to drill down on with this bill, because like we said, there's 41 subsections. But uh, thank you so much for the time you've given us today. We do appreciate it. My pleasure, and thank you for giving us the time to be on.